I'm glad to be able to join you today as we discuss the parable of the wheat and the tares. This parable is found in Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 through 30, and is one of only the two parables that Jesus explained to his disciples. So since Jesus explained this parable, we are under no uh, illusion about what it means. We know what it means because Christ told us what it means. Uh, the interpretation of it is actually found in verses 36 through 40. Now in this parable, we find a farmer who sows some wheat seed. And during a while they, after he sowed the seed, then an enemy came and sowed some tares. Now the tares are a plant which is very similar to wheat, almost impossible to distinguish between the tares and the wheat when it is young. Only when it's older it, can you tell that the difference between the wheat and the tares. But of course by then the roots of the two plants are so intertwined that the wheat would be greatly damaged when you pulled up the tares. And so in this parable then, we find a farmer who sold the wheat, but an enemy came and sold some tares among the wheat. And then only later did his servants realize what had happened. And then they came to the master and sold him that the tares among the wheat. Would you want us to pull the tares out? And there the master said, no, leave them. And then when it's time for the harvest, then we will separate the two plants. Now, in this parable, we find the interpretation of Jesus. In this case, the sower is the one is the son of man. He's the one who sows the good seed. It is Christ who went about preaching and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. The field is the world, the world in which we live, all of mankind. In Psalm 24 and verse 1, it is stated that the earth is the Lord's in all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. So everything in the world belongs to God, including you and I. The good seed then, or the wheat, are the sons of the kingdom. It is not the gospel as we find in other parables, but in this case, the, the sons of the kingdom, those who truly observe all the commands of Christ, they are the good seed. The tares, then, are the sons of the wicked one, that is, those who are serving Satan themselves. Oh, they may resemble the good seed, but the tares are poisonous and their doctrines are deadly. The enemy are, is Satan himself. The enemy is the one who tried to tempt Christ and failed in Matthew chapter 4. The enemy or Satan tries to destroy now the efforts of Christ to save souls. Satan is always interested in stopping the work of God. The harvest would be the final judgment. And this is a common metaphor in the Bible of the final judgment being referred to as the harvest. The reapers, in this case, are the angels. So then angels will accompany Christ when he comes again and help with the judgment in some way or the other. We're just not told exactly how. But here, in this case, the reapers are the angels. So now let's look at some lessons we can learn from this parable. Well, one, one is we see that Christ is long-suffering. Why does Christ suffer so long with the wicked around us? I mean, that's a question that we often ask. Why doesn't God just destroy the wicked? You see, we are all concerned about the presence of tares. We're concerned with the bad things that Satan does in the world. And we wonder, why doesn't God just take them out of the world? Why doesn't God just punish them? Now, the problem of the tares will not be fully addressed until the harvest. It is at the end of the age that the Son of Man, or Christ, will finally resolve this problem. You see, as long as the world stands, good and evil will exist together. We cannot, with physical force, overcome the evil of the world. We should not try to overcome the evil of the world with physical force. 
Paul said in 2 Corinthians 10 in verse 3, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. Now in the history of Christianity, we have found at times Christians have tried to overcome evil with force. And they tried to force people to become Christians and to live the right way. That is not what we should be doing. Christianity is not what is not one in that way. As Paul said, we do not war according to the flesh. But why the delay? Why does God allow a delay like this? Why does he allow them to exist together? Well, in this parable, we find it is out of concern for the wheat that the tares were allowed to remain. It is the trying of our faith that produces faith patience, according to James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. And Peter indicated in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9 that it was the long suffering of God in allowing men to repent is the reason why he allows evil to continue to exist. Notice in that verse, Peter said, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So here we find Peter said, God allows evil to exist so that more people will repent. So while Christ is certainly desires that all men come to repentance, he has a special interest in those sons of the kingdom who are still growing. God wants us to grow. God wants us to be saved. And God gives us time to be saved. And then we find the field then is the world. Some people try to say the field is the church and therefore we should not try to get the evil out of the church. But that's the misinterpretation of the parable. We know what the field is because Christ tells us what the field is. And it is the world. And in the world, the good and evil will exist together. The point of this parable is that Jesus himself will not do anything visible until the end of the age when he comes with his angels. You see, it is not the responsibility of the church to wipe out all the evil people in the world. And this is what we mentioned before. We, as part of the church, should not try to force people to become part of the church. That is not our responsibility. We cannot force people to do what is right. They have to obey Christ from the heart, and we cannot force that. And so good and evil would exist together during this life. But there will come a time when they will be judged. The place of punishment is the reward of the wicked. You see, the punishment of the wicked is a recurring theme in several of the parables. Just because the wicked is not punished right now does not mean the wicked will not be punished. Clearly, we see that in this passage. A proper proclamation of the gospel of the kingdom must of necessity include a warning to those who do not receive the kingdom. You know, sometimes people try to say that we must simply preach a positive gospel. Don't preach anything negative such as punishment of the wicked or such as the uh, to place of hell. Do not preach about hell. Only preach God's love. Well, you see, we cannot properly do that. When we preach the kingdom and the gospel of the kingdom, then by necessity, it also includes a warning against those who do not accept the kingdom. That's what we find in this parable. And in this parable, we find that Christ will finally, at the last day, come with his angels and gather out of his kingdom two things. He will gather out of his kingdom those who offend, that is, those who cause others to stumble. Jesus warned his disciples against causing his little ones to stumble or to be offended. And Paul warned the Christians at Corinth and at Rome against causing division in the church. 
Yes, God, must. we must be very careful uh, to not cause others to stumble. And we must be very careful ourselves not to practice lawlessness. This is the second group that's going to be separated out. Lawlessness would be doing those things that is without authority. You see, everything we do must have the authority of God. In Colossians 3 and verse 17, Paul said, Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of by the authority of the Lord Jesus. We must, but to be doing it in the name of Christ is to do it by the authority of Christ. If we do not use it by have authority for what we do, then we are practicing lawlessness. We're going beyond the law. And when Jesus separates the good from the evil, then the sons of the wicked one, the sons of the Satan, will be cast into the furnace of fire where there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. This, of course, is the ultimate expression of of torment. Man cannot properly judge between the wicked and the saved. Yet there are some people who are obviously wicked. But for many times we really cannot tell the difference. There are some in the church whom we cannot really tell the difference ourselves whether they are right with God or not. They may look much the same. Outward appearances are often deceiving. You see, there is sometimes much that we do not know about even our most intimate acquaintances. You see, we cannot judge the heart, but God is the judge. And at the last day, God will send his angels and will judge the world. And then there will be a great separation, a great separation between the good and the bad, between the wicked and the saved. And we must not deceive ourselves that just because the church accepts us, then God will accept me. In this parable, we find a clear picture that the good and the evil will exist side by side. Yes, even in the church, we'll have those that are true Christians and those that are only pretending to be Christians. They may look like they're Christians, but their heart is not in it. And if we're not serving God from the heart, we can rest assured that God will not accept us. So we need to make sure that we're serving God from the heart, that our righteousness is not just an outward appearance, but is true to the heart. But one day, Judgment Day will come. And then when Judgment Day comes, then there will be an eternal separation of the good and the evil. We must not deceive ourselves into thinking that God will not judge the world. Yes, there is going to be a judgment in the world. The good will be separated from the evil. And that the, good, the evil will be punished the good will be rewarded. You see, at the harvest, the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. The righteous will experience eternal bliss in the fulfillment of all their hopes, being with God forever and forever. But the wicked will be punished with eternal fire and weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, the ultimate torment. I hope that this will encourage each one of you to make sure that we are truly serving God, that we're not just serving God by, by appearances. We're not just trying to look like we're serving God, but we're serving him from the heart. That's the only kind of service that's going to make a difference. So I hope today that this will encourage you to do just right and hope that it will encourage you to live your life in preparation for the final separation, the final judgment, which eventually will come to each one of us. Thank you for your attention today. It is God's will that you must be saved. First, listen to the Bible truth and you must believe the truth. Then you must repent from your sinful life.
then you must confess by words that the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God. You must be baptized for the remission of your sins. Every day our Lord added those who were being saved into his church. Be blessed by studying the word of God. To receive the Voice of Truth International Magazine and to study the Bible systematically through our English Bible Correspondent Course, kindly write to us. Our address, Gracious Word, PO Box 15. Our study Madurai 625016 Tamil Nadu. For more details, dial 9244204420. 9244214421. God bless you. The Church of Christ salutes you.